Explore the past, present, and future of the Great Plains with hands-on, interactive exhibits for all ages. Learn about the people, the places, and the things that make up the Great Plains by watching a show in the auditorium, stopping by the outdoor trading post, or braving through the terrible Tuesday Tornado Theater. Schools, active military, and senior citizens can also come to enjoy the museum for a discounted price. Visit the primary tourist attraction in all of Southwest Oklahoma, the Museum of the Great Plains. Many people believe that the start of Fort Sill was back in 1870, but on today's episode of Historically Speaking, we're going back even further with historian Frank Siltman.
So Colonel Gerson is an interesting character because he is given command of the 10th Cavalry when they established the Black Regiments. Not a regular Army officer, not a West Point graduate. He's a music teacher from Jacksonville, Illinois, who enlists in the 6th Illinois Cavalry in 1861, rises up through the ranks and uh, commands a brigade uh, towards the end of the Civil War and in fact leads a very famous raid, Gerson's Raid, from uh, Tennessee through Mississippi all the way down to Baton Rouge destroying Confederate infrastructure, supply lines, railroads, and uh, did a great job. And they, uh, unfortunately, his brigade was pretty decimated as a result of that. And so he is given command of black troops during the Civil War. So when they establish permanent black regiments, he's one of the few officers that's willing to command a black regiment. Racism is inherently present. People think that that would be bad for their career. So here's Gerson, who gets to stay in the Army as a full colonel and uh, uh, command regiment and so other officers and Custer's a great example. Custer's a two-star general, uh, temporary rank called a brevet. At the end of the Civil War the Army downsizes from 1.1 million soldiers down to 57,000 soldiers and they look at some of these generals and say thanks for your service but if you want to stay in the Army you're a captain. And so that happened to Custer, he's actually Captain Custer. Uh, fortunately, unfortunately for him his mentor Phil Sheridan found him his job as a lieutenant colonel of the 7th Cavalry. But Grierson gets to stay as a full colonel commanding a regiment. And uh, so he raises the 10th Cavalry up in Kansas, brings it from Fort uh, Scott down to uh, Fort Gibson, and then eventually, again, as I mentioned, in the summer of 1868, passes through here on the way to Fort Cobb. So as the garrison commander here at Fort Sill, he oversees the construction. He's overseeing the activities uh, with the Army and in dealing with the Native American tribes. Uh, when Grant's elected president in 1868, he changes the Native American policy. Instead of the Army being Indian agents, they bring in Bureau of Indian Affairs Quakers as the Indian agents. And so Gerson's here for that. And Lori Tatum comes in as the first Indian agent under the Quaker policy. Unfortunately, as time goes on, 1871, uh, the tribes on the reservations are still very restless and they begin raiding back into Texas, the Kiowa being some of the most aggressive. So in May of 1871, um, the governor of Texas, Governor Davis, sends a letter to President Grant complaining that the Army's not doing enough to protect North Texas from Indian raids. And in fact, they even include, in, accuse the Army of providing arms and ammunition uh, to the Native Americans. And so now General Sherman is the commanding general of the Army, essentially the chief of staff in today's terms, and General Grant sends him out, President Grant sends him out on an inspection tour. And so he it lands at uh, Galveston and works his way up through Texas. And at one point, he's actually going from Fort Belknap, which is near what is today Graham, Texas, over to Fort Richardson in Jacksboro. What they don't know is about 150 warriors under Satank, Satanta and Big Tree and uh, the medicine man, uh, the Hote uh, Mamati, are sitting on a hill near Cox Mountain on the Salt Prairie watching General Sherman and now General Marcy and their escort go by. And they're like, hey, let's go get those guys. And it's uh, the medicine man, Mamati, who says, no, no, that's bad medicine, let's, let's not do that. And so they let them go by and along comes the Warren Wagon Train. And so we have the Warren Wagon Train Massacre uh, seven Teamsters are killed, uh, they take all the mules, they burn the wagons, what they can't carry they, they burn. Uh, five of the Teamsters escape and make it to Fort Richardson. Uh, General Sherman's absolutely outraged. It's pretty gruesome uh, when they go to bury the bodies. I mean, 
mutilated, tortured uh, bodies, and so they're they're very angry. Uh, Sherman gets here to Fort Sill, and he directs Colonel Grierson to do an investigation. It doesn't take long to find out what happened because, in fact, Satanta Satank, uh, Big Tree. Uh, aren't hiding what they did essentially, or at least especially Satanta. Uh, they're at the Indian Agency store and in front of Lori Tatum and the translators, Satanta is bragging about all his mules that he's captured and doesn't hide the fact that they'd been on this raid. So Lori Tatum writes a letter to General Sherman and uh, Colonel Grierson and says, hey, these are the guys you're looking for. So Sherman orders the Kiowa chiefs to be brought to the front porch of the Sherman house uh, which is why it's called the Sherman House today. Uh, it was Colonel Gerson's quarters. And he basically tells the chiefs, you aren't men of honor, you aren't warriors, you violated a treaty, so you're criminals and you're going to be treated like criminals and you're going to be taken to Texas and put in prison. And of course, they don't take that very well, they're upset. Uh, Lone Wolf is uh, at the meeting and he's got a carbine hidden under his blanket, pulls it out. Uh, points it at General Sherman. Colonel Gerson standing near him. He grabs the carbine and they wrestle over the carbine. Uh, then uh, Stumbling Bear pulls out a bow and arrow and points it at General Sherman. And uh, it's believed that it was Kicking Bird, who was a peace chief who advocated peace getting along, uh, knocked it away so that General Sherman's life was, was saved. And so this attempted assassination of General Sherman is the uh, Sherman House story and uh, why it is today still called the Sherman House. Chief of Staff of the Army, Commanding General of the Army, and actually in the 1880s, if you don't know, Sherman, uh, the Republican Party tried to draft him twice to run for president, and he's the one who initiated the quote, if nominated, I will not run, if elected, I will not serve. It wasn't Lyndon Johnson in 1968. It was, well, comes to Sherman. Uh, and so, a guy who probably could have been president of the United States, just by asking, almost assassinated here on the front porch of the commander's quarters at Fort Sill. Uh, Satank, Satanta, and Big Tree are imprisoned in a dungeon underneath the South Cavalry Barracks, building 441 today. Uh, the 4th Cavalry from Fort Richardson comes up to uh, take them and escort them down to Texas. Uh, Satank actually has a knife hidden away and is, is planning to stab and assassinate Colonel Gerson. Uh, Big Tree stops him from doing that. But they get on the wagon and when they go and pass over what is today I-44 where Sitting Bear Creek uh, crosses the, the interstate. Uh, Satank pulls out his knife, attacks the guard, knocks the guard out of the wagon, takes his rifle, uh, is trying to fire the rifle, is shot once, continues to try to load the rifle, and is shot a second time and killed. Uh, and so at that point, Satank and Big Tree are taken to Fort Richardson. Uh, Satank's body is left. Uh, Satanta continues to not deny that he was part of the raid. In fact, his defense is, I was part of the raid, but I didn't kill anybody. I just was there. Um, and really that's his undoing, is what he thinks is, he thinks it's okay because he was part of the, he was at the raid, he didn't kill anybody, and they lost seven men, and the whites lost seven men, so he said, it's even, we're good. Uh, unfortunately for him, the Jack County jury didn't see it that way and Big Tree and uh, Satanta are imprisoned in Huntsville in Texas State Penitentiary uh, and basically are hostages to make sure that the Kiowa stay in line and that's the the Kiowa told as long as you stay in line uh, these guys will be okay and a couple of years later they are in fact paroled on the promise that the Kiowa continue to not raid uh, unfortunately with the advent of the Red River Wars, even though he's not directly tied to the Red River Wars, Satanta then, his parole is revoked and he's taken back to the Texas State Penitentiary. Uh, and so that's really the story of the Sherman House and the outcome of the Sherman House. Um, an interesting, interesting book that covers that, by the way, is The Indian Trial. And if you uh, read that, it goes into a lot of detail about the Sherman House incident, the Warren Wagon Train Massacre, as well as the trial in uh, Jack County. And so that really uh, uh, is a wide-ranging story. You know, when we talk about it, the Sherman House and the Warren Wagon Train Massacre, but it goes into the whole relationship of the tribes and the Army and the Indian Territory versus how they viewed Texas and Texans. Uh, and so uh, uh, valuable insight into the culture and relationships 
and the fact that the Army's job is not only to protect North Texas from raids from the uh, Native Americans, but also to protect the Indian Territory from incursions uh, by the whites. And, and uh, what we often find interesting is that Colonel uh, Richards, uh, what we also find interesting is that Colonel McKenzie at uh, Fort uh, Richardson in Jacksboro had to ask permission of Colonel Grierson to even come into the Indian Territory in order to pick up his prisoners. And so Colonel Grierson and the 10th Cavalry, their job here is to protect the Indian Territory from any illegal or unauthorized incursions, whether it's from Texas, from the Texas Rangers, Texas civilians, or even other Army units that aren't stationed within the reservation. So ultimately, uh, 1874, I mentioned the Red River Wars. You have the outbreak of the Red River Wars with the Second Battle of Adobe Walls. Uh, you've got Comanche, Kiowa, and Cheyenne, uh, warriors that are involved in the uh, Second Battle of Adobe Walls. The Red River Wars very quickly put down by the Army to send troops from uh, Fort Bascom in New Mexico Territory, Fort Lyon, uh, and uh, Fort Sill. And so, very quickly, uh, the Red River Wars come to an end. The last band is Quanta Parker and the Quahata Comanche, and they're in Paladero Canyon. And of course, uh, Ronald McKenzie, the 4th Cavalry, uh, they defeat uh, Quanta Parker at Paladero Canyon in 1874. Six months later, Quanta Parker walks in here. They'd lost their horse herd and surrenders under the terms. Uh, the treaties and the, the, really the end of the Red River Wars ends hostilities for the most part on the frontier and so Fort Sill really becomes a caretaker post at that point providing those requirements under the treaty obligations. Uh, they had two giant cattle herds, one near what is today Hoyle Bridge, the other one near Low Water Crossing at the end of uh, uh, the, the Four Corners and uh, the uh, end of Randolph Road and so they would supply cattle they also provi provided tonnage, blankets, other commodities. Uh, apparently coffee and sugar were very popular, of course, uh, just like today. And uh, so really that's the Army's role uh, at the end of the 1870s. It really becomes that, that caretaker relationship. Bureau of Indian Affairs had an Indian agent. The Indian agency was on the other side of what is today Henry Post Airfield, uh, near, down near Lori Tatum Road in that area. And uh, so the primary person involved with dealing with the tribes, the Indian Agency, and the Army is here to back them up, to provide security, and to provide those resources and supplies. And so Fort Sill remains that way until uh, really World War I. Uh, they have a short time of, uh, during the Spanish-American War where the place is virtually abandoned. Uh, but uh, the artillery school comes here in 1911 and moving from Fort Monroe, Virginia. And once the artillery school here, it really becomes that second life for Fort Sill. And then World War I really sees the tremendous growth of Fort Sill. Uh, the aviation school is brought here, the Henry Post Army Airfield. Uh, the infantry school is here, the artillery school is here. They do chemical warfare training at Fort Sill. They train the 35th Division of the Missouri and Kansas National Guard. And so from that point on, Fort Sill becomes the center of artillery training in the United States and probably the largest and most uh, complex artillery training center in the world I would I would submit and so when we talk about Fort Sill a lot of us think of it in terms of today but what's more important is to go back and to look at those origins that precede even the state of Texas the 1834 expedition the 1852 expeditions uh, the founding of Fort Sill those relationships with the tribes and how really the relationships with the army and the tribes and the neighboring states really is all so tied together. It is the history of Southwest United States, what we call Texoma, and uh, it is the history of Oklahoma. <laughs>